It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning, everyone. Live today from the Green Space, WNYC Street Level Theater here at 160 Varick Street in Lower Manhattan. And when we're in the Green Space, you can watch the Brian Lehrer Show as well as listen as we have cameras here and we stream live video on our website at WNYC.org. So tune in to that if you want to see the faces behind the voices. And we begin today with two WNYC voices who you may well know to take some stock of the midterm election campaign locally and nationally in the days after the polarizing Brett Kavanaugh process. And we'll talk about some other stuff as well. Kai Wright, host of our national politics podcast, The United States of Anxiety. Their current season is about gender and political power. The new episode out today is about, you know that whole first woman thing and the election of 16? No, not Hillary Clinton <laughs> in 2016. Jeanette Rankin in 1916, the first woman ever elected to the House of Representatives. And we're going to go way back in history a little later in the segment and hear a clip of Jeanette Rankin. We'll talk about that and all the races nationally that Kai is watching today. And Nancy Solomon, our New Jersey public radio editor. Nancy is following the swing districts in New Jersey very closely. Hi, Kai. Hi, Nancy. Hey, Brian. Hi, Brian. Hey, everybody. Nancy, New Jersey's seventh congressional district. From Union and Summit, more or less, near the city, out to the Pennsylvania line, and from around Mount Olive in the north to around Lambertsville in the south, big district area-wise. And there, Republican Representative Leonard Lance, the incumbent, is up against Democrat Tom Malinowski. And the controversy over the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh has seeped into this race. We're going to play a clip. Uh, Malinowski has made an attack ad now against Lance using a clip of Lance speaking to Rutgers Republicans in which he says about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford that, quote, he tends not to believe the charges. Here's a short clip from the ad that I guess features Lance's voice. I think Judge Kavanaugh is a brilliant judge. I tend not to believe the charges. Well, there it was. I think Judge Kavanaugh is a brilliant judge. I tend not to believe the charges. What was that from? Was that an accidentally recorded when he didn't know mics were rolling moment? No, he was speaking to Republican students at Rutgers, as you mentioned. Um, and But what is what you don't understand when you just hear the clip, which angered him greatly, is that this was at the moment at which there was question about whether Dr. Ford was going to testify. So this was now a couple weeks ago. Early in that process. Yeah, and and his full remarks, basically, he said, uh, these are serious accusations. She needs to come to, to the Senate Judiciary Committee and testify, which, of course, was, you know, the Republican position uh, about in, at that moment about that situation. So um, he was really furious, and I, I spoke to him about it, about the fact that Malinowski, his challenger, was taking this out of context. But um, on the other hand, you know, this he can't really distance himself from the Republican line and everything that's come since he said those things. So He'd, it is a problem for him. But nevertheless, he did say, even before hearing her testify and being able to make a judgment based on her testimony um, that he tended not to believe the charges. So he kind of prejudged it to some degree. Right. And that was pretty much in line with the Republican stance, which was to say, oh, these are serious allegations and she needs to come testify, but we don't think it's, we don't right. really believe it. And do you happen to know how Lance wound up at the end of the process? Did he, you know, he's a sort of Susan Collinsy moderate Republican. Tell yes. me if you think that's a good comparison in general for him. So did he wind up in Susan Collins land afterwards? Um, I have not spoken to him since. I think he has not spoken out against the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. So I believe he is. Uh, most likely in the Republican camp on this. Um, 
And, you know, I think to the extent that Leonard Lance is a moderate Republican in the tradition of New Jersey moderate Republicanism, uh, which is a great storied tradition, um, I think is central to this election. Um, that, you know, he may be the last man standing of the the moderate wing of the Republican Party and um, in, the, in the state in the state and one of a very small handful uh, in the country uh, former governor Christine Todd Whitman is supporting him she believes he's a moderate Malinowski is attacking him and 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 the grassroots activists who started right after the election of Donald Trump do not believe he's a moderate um, and and they argue a you know, he has towed the line with the party, and, the, and that line has moved more and more to the right every year. And B, even if he is a moderate, the goal this year is to get Democratic control of the, the House. You know, he, he, and they're asking independents and moderate Republicans to agree with them on this point, that, that it would be better for democracy to have a check against uh, full mm -hmm. Republican power in Washington. So. You probably can't answer this question at this point, and I realize there are a lot of issues in this race, other than Kavanaugh, you just mentioned some of them. Um, but in a way, we get a little Rorschach test in the seventh district in New Jersey with a moderate Republican, Leonard Lance, who expressed skepticism early on about Dr. Blasey Ford. And to the extent that this has inflamed people and energized the base on both sides, uh, we'll get a, and and he's got a public position and is being you know blasted in these ads that showed what he said early on to uh, the College Republican Club at Rutgers. Um, there's a little Rorschach test here. Yeah, no, I I think there is, and I think when you know the two races that are being watched very closely, really all the all the Republican held seats in New Jersey are being watched very closely this season, but. The seventh, what we're talking about with Leonard Lance, and then there's the 11th, which was the Rodney Freelingheisen seat, where Mikey Sherrill, the Democrat, is facing a conservative Republican, Jay Weber. Um, both of these districts are, they're close to each other, they're side by side, and they're very, very similar. And, uh, and there is a poll that came out from the 11th district just yesterday that polled people right you know, right as Kavanaugh was happening and after the confirmation, and uh, and found that really this is just shoring up the base, that people, it hasn't changed anybody's mind. If you were full-on Republican, then you, you think it was right to confirm Kavanaugh, and if you're full-on Democrat, you think that it was uh, a huge mistake and a travesty. Um, and so I, I think you know, that's what, and I, I'm certain that the seven would poll very much like the mm -hmm. 11th district. I think what's interesting, though, is that, um, you know, my sense of what I see online is that Kavanaugh really um, means a lot to young women who don't turn out to vote in great numbers, and especially not in a midterm election. And I think that's where the polling may, uh, you know, not show us what kind of a, a gender gap which we already know there's a gender gap that's going to happen on mm -hmm. November 6. But uh, I think young women, if they come out to vote, uh, there is you know, so much upset about Kavanaugh. That could be the wild card. Yeah, good point. And in a larger sense, I think the Me Too movement and where it becomes excessive in some people's eyes or not breaks very much along gender lines. And so it's kind of consistent in a certain respect that Susan Collins might be, at her age, um, more likely to dismiss the charges or believe the one side versus the other than some women who might be similar to her in other ways but are younger. Um, all right, Kai Wright, on the podcast, United States of Anxiety, you spoke to a very relevant Republican woman, Jennifer Willoughby, the ex-wife of Trump White House aide Rob Porter, who lost his job amid allegations that he had abused her. The details surfaced in part because of a blog post that she wrote about the abuse. And so here is Jennifer Willoughby, ex-wife of Trump White House aide Rob Porter, talking to Amanda Aronchik, WNYC producer, who asked if Willoughby ever regretted writing that post, given how much online harassment it brought her way. I have not for one second felt regretful about that blog post. That's because of the other kind of responses she was getting. The hundreds of comments that were coming in on this blog post, the hundreds of tweets 
direct messages, emails of people sharing their story, men and women telling me how I had saved their lives, asking me for help. One person wrote, I keep a screenshot of this on my phone. I read it every day. I'm telling him tomorrow that I'm leaving. It's possible I won't make it out of this house alive. I mean, it was just <sighs> earth shattering to me that I could have that much of an impact just by telling the truth. Kai Wright, talk about Jennifer Willoughby and why you included her in the United States of Anxiety. We actually started the season with Jennifer Willoughby's story. Um, and what's remarkable is how, how similar it is to Christine Blasey Ford's. Um, she was a reluctant um, public figure. She did not seek this out. Uh, she was going through her own personal private process uh, of healing from the abuse that she received. Uh, press found out about it and sort of dragged her uh, into public. She decided once the press had gotten her name that she wanted to own her own story, and so she came out and told it. Uh, and she received uh, just horrific uh, violent, vile uh, hate speech from uh, many people in the country in response to it. The White House uh, insisted she was lying, uh, and it wasn't until, in this case, uh, one of uh, Rob Porter's other uh, uh, spouses produced a photo of herself having been beaten up uh, that, um, that Porter was held accountable. Um, so that's how, that's where it, it starts to, to divert from the Brett Kavanaugh story. Um, but it was, it's, it's, was important to us because if we're talking about gender and power and we're talking about how it shows up in the election, you, you just cannot separate this election from the Me Too movement. You, you, you simply cannot. Um, and, uh, and when you think about the districts that Nancy is describing, um, you know, they are going to be, they're going to be definitive. Districts like the, these, those in, in New, Jer New Jersey are going to be definitive all over the country in this election because they are places where college-educated white women have not been reliable Democrats um, as congressional voters. Uh, and the question is, uh, w will, they, will, will the, the consequence of the past year's worth uh, of politics uh, lead them to be reliable Democrats uh, in this election and moving forward in those districts. And if so, that reshapes American politics entirely. And Willoughby says later in the episode that if you still think this is about the White House, yep. you're missing the point. What did she mean by that? For her, she meant, you know, this is about, this This isn't a, about a narrow question of Donald Trump. It's not about a narrow question of politics. This is about uh, the question of us, she's speaking for herself as women, uh, saying we will no longer carry the shame of these men's abuse. She had carried Rob Porter's shame for her. She, her process involved her say, realizing, wait a minute, I have nothing to lose if this new, news comes out. She was hiding it for him because she felt shameful. It was about the failure of her marriage and the failure of all of these things that she had wanted from life. You know, she had this fancy life as this you know, as fancy guy's wife. Uh, and, um, and she went through a process of realizing that's his dream, not mine. Uh, and so what she's trying to say to the people she was speaking to and to women is that we have to get to a place where we realize this is their dream, not ours, uh, and, and, and setting politics aside. What's notable is that Jennifer Wilby actually doesn't, she, she did not seek Rob Porter's job. She did not want him to lose her job. It was not a politics question it was his for job. her. Uh -huh. uh, it was a personal empowerment question for her. Listeners, if you're just joining us, Brian Lairshow, live in the green space today, WNYC's Kai Wright, host of the United States of Anxiety podcast, and our New Jersey public radio editor, Nancy Solomon, our first guest here on the green space stage. You can watch the program as well as listen when we're in the green space. We stream live video at WNYC.org. Go check it out if you want. And on gender and politics, here's Donald Trump yesterday praising his outgoing UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, as if to thumb his nose at the modern rules of how not to make professional women's, professional women's qualities about their looks. Well, we have a number of people that would very much like to do it. It's a great position. And uh, Nikki realizes that she's, uh, that she's, I think she's helped make it a much better position, if you want to know the truth. I think it's become maybe a more glamorous position than it was two years ago. Maybe I wonder why, but it is. It, yeah, I mean, she's made it a very glamorous position. She's made it a, a more important, more importantly, a more important position. 
Let's see. What did he say about um, about uh, John Bolton? Thank you. Same one I was thinking of that he's made it a more glamorous position to be national security advisor. <laughs> You know, I mean, the thing is, Nikki Haley also is setting aside the president of the United States and all of his stuff. Uh, Nikki Haley is pretty smart. Um, she has played this quite well. Uh, setting a, Whether I agree or disagree with her politics, uh, she is leaving the White House as one of the very, very few people who have managed to engage with this administration and walk away uh, on her own terms. Uh, and that is quite notable. That's both a supporter of Donald Trump, which she very much reaffirmed yesterday, yes. and somebody who is seen as independent from some of his Michigas, including some of his sort of policy stuff where he's so soft on Russia, but she isn't. She managed to walk that line. And she I, gets out right before the midterms. Yes. You know, uh, she, she's, she's managing this quite well. I was thinking that a catch-22 for Democrats in terms of taking back the Senate, um, in order to try to take back what they feel should have been Merrick Garland's Supreme Court seat, they would have had to block Kavanaugh and then take the Senate to block a next Trump nominee. But playing that much hardball with the nomination may have enraged Republican voters, making it harder to take back the Senate. So there was only a very narrow path to Supreme Court victory there, and it may have backfired. Kavanaugh got confirmed anyway, and the Senate, Kai, seems more out of reach in a backlash to the process. There are all these polls showing the close Senate races are trending more Republican than they did a week or two ago. Uh, and these are just the polls of the moment. The election is still four weeks from yesterday. And the way the news goes these days, you know, another big thing or two or three could still happen. But nevertheless, they had this very narrow, almost catch-22. Well, I mean, let's let's back up and, and sort of remember, be, be a little sober about it. You know, I mean, first off, the Democrats do not have the power to block a Supreme Court nominee. They just don't have the votes. Um, and they didn't have it before this, and they didn't have it after it. And... Um, uh, the fact of Christine Blasey Ford's bravery and coming forward created a, um, a an unexpected and political opening that should have never existed. They, they just did not have these votes. Um, uh, so the fact that there was a debate over this nomination, a meaningful debate over this nomination at all, uh, is, uh, is, is remarkable. Um, and, um, you know, what long-term effect does it have? I think, you know, we I, I, yesterday I spoke with... Um, Kelly Dittmar from the Center for Women in American Politics about this question, you know, and um, and that she made a smart point that listen, you know, whatever was going to be the case, this we already knew that that Democratic women, um, in particular, Democrats in general, but Democratic women in particular, uh, are very enthusiastic about this election. It, whatever was going at some point, Republicans were also going to get enthusiastic. It was it could have been this, it could have been something else, but but by the time we got to now, the Republican base was also going to become engaged. You think that was inevitable, Nancy, in the Republican-held swing districts that you're covering in New Jersey? Do you think that was inevitable? No, but New Jersey's not typical, uh, you know, because it is so much more moderate, and I think there is just a tremendous number of. Republicans and independents who have voted Republican who are very unhappy with what's coming out of Washington. So I think it's a little bit of a, it's different than these Republican states where uh, the Senate race has now been energized by uh, the Kavanaugh. And, you know, it, and it's, it's long been said that the Supreme Court and the pick over who could, who, you know, who sits on the Supreme Court has been much more important to conservative Republicans uh, over the last 20 years yeah. than it has been to Democrats. I mean, they've seen themselves as on the losing end, and this has been one of the issues that fires up the base more than any other. Um, you know, now I think we're going to see a generation of Democrats who are much more focused and upset about the Supreme Court than what we've seen. And I mean, and the, the question, too, is to remember that there, the Senate was always far out of reach for Democrats. Um, and the fact that we're discussing it being in a play at all uh, is, is remarkable. We're going to take a short break. Control room, heads up. We're going to take our first break. And then we'll continue much more with Kai Wright and Nancy Solomon from the Green Space. And you can, open, you can uh, call in as we're opening the phones, 212-433-WNYC, 212 433 Nine six nine two. Audience here in the green space, raise your hand. If you have a question, we'll come around with a mic, and we'll continue right after this. Hello, New York City friends. 
I'm Krista Tippett, and I'm thrilled to share that I'll be recording a live episode of On Being with poet and MacArthur Genius Fellow Claudia Rankin as part of the Work It Festival from WNYC Studios. Our conversation will take place on November 12th at 7 p.m. at the K Playhouse at Hunter College. This is an evening you won't want to miss, so buy tickets now at workitevents.com. That's workit, W-E-R-K-I-T, events.com. WNYC supporters include Lincoln Center's White Light Festival, presenting Borderline, the dance performance that the London Evening Standard calls Poetry in Gravity-Defying Motion, October 19th and 20th. Tickets at whitelightfestival.org. John Thurr Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center, part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hackensack Meridian Health Partnership. Learn how John Thurr Cancer Center is pioneering the possible at jtcancercenter.org. WNYC is a media partner of Strand Bookstore, presenting journalist Gabriella Wiener discussing her book Sexographies, an account of her time infiltrating the inside of a Peruvian prison. October 11th, info at strandbooks.com. This is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820. NPR News and the New York Conversation. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live from the Green Space today. We stream live video from the Green Space so you can watch the show as well as listen at WNYC.org if you want to do that. Our first guest still with us as we talk post-Kavanaugh national politics and midterm election New Jersey politics, a number of really important swing congressional seats in play in New Jersey. Nancy Solomon, our New Jersey public radio managing editor, and Kai Wright host of our United States of Anxiety podcast. And I see we have a question here in the green space. Hello, sir. Hi, Brian. <clears throat> My third question to you. I, I love coming here. And I anyway, don't think there's... Uh, now we've question, got this mic. Go ahead. Question for, basically for the press. You know, Dr. Ford, and I listened to her testimony, it was very believable, but I also believe... It. Keep that mic yeah, right yeah, near I also okay. believe in the presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. So I'm right in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, she put her faith in her congressperson and put her faith in her senator to preserve her privacy. That privacy was violated. I'm not saying it was Diane or, or the other... Mm -hmm. But somebody in the staff, somebody in the Democratic Party decided her privacy wasn't worth it, and they leaked it to the press. You know, the press isn't that good. So that's a, that's a question I'd like to see you answer because... Yeah, and I, it's a really important question, and I think that it is one that has not been reported out yet. Kai and Nancy, Kai, you're more on the national beat. Maybe you've looked at this a little a little more. I haven't seen... Dr. Blasey Ford asked if she's really angry at whoever leaked that to the press when she was trying to keep her name confidential, and Diane Feinstein at first seemed to be trying to keep her name confidential, uh, or, you know, the etiology of how it happened. Well, actually, Dr. Blasey Ford has been clear that she feels like her, that she was handled appropriately um, by the Democratic caucus. She's been very clear about that. Though she, 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 she did say in her testimony, that she only decided to come forward publicly after the press was showing up After the up press started showing up and door. she wanted to be in control of her story. But, right. she, but, but she also has said she does not feel like her privacy was violated by anyone that she spoke to. She has said that. That is what she has said. What I think is what is actually mo remarkable is that this has become the discussion. That's actually what I think is just striking. It's setting aside... Uh, I'm not going to debate whether or not it's the, you know, whether or not someone has violated a privacy, but um, but the fact that this is, this was the argument. The Republicans had a very narrow set of arguments they could make in this case, and they could argue process, and they ha they had to come up with a villain, and she couldn't be the villain, right? And so they and, and so this idea that. The real crime here right. was right. the way in which Diane Feinstein handled Christine Blasey's Ford right. uh, Ford's accusations. But, but they would say a, a, a you know more benevolent toward them or benign toward them explanation is sure both sides were playing as hardball politics as they could to win as each side saw it, 
And yet, as part of playing that politics, if it did leak from somebody in the Democratic camp, some staff member or who knows who, that here, look at one of the things that they were willing to do, just one of the things in the story, um, to leak the name of an alleged you know, sexual abuse victim uh, who wanted to remain private in order to get to their W. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't, I, we, I wasn't there. We, ha we haven't reported the story out. I can only go with what Christine Blasey Ford says, which is that she feels fine with the yeah. process. You know, there are uh, this, we have entered into this era also, I think is interesting, where there's this, the word leak is, uh, is immediately a slur. Uh, there were, uh, it, the idea that this would have set uh, in front, uh, in front of both the United States Senate and the White House, uh, for more than uh, a week without someone leaking it is 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 ridiculous in the first place. But to me, I, I, what is striking is the politics of it. That this be that how successful, and because it really was an important part of the win that 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 the Republican caucus had on this was their success in creating a a villain that was not Christine Blasey Ford in this argument, and so they yep. succeeded at that, and that is now the public conversation, and, and, and that's a big part of why Kavanaugh's on the court. Let's see. Some of the tweets coming in on this. One says, simply, I don't believe Dr. Ford. Another one says, simply, so-called president is a pig. Another <laughs> one says, Lance is no moderate. As we say in NJ7, he plays a moderate on TV. <laughs> yeah. Nancy, um, New Jersey's 11th congressional district. Marstown, Montville, Madison, Mendham, and some towns that don't start with them, like Parsippany, Livingston, Wayne, and Wanakew. I love saying Wanakew. <laughs> Been held by Republicans since 1984, mostly by Rodney Freelingheisen, but there's a real shot that could change this year. You spoke to one voter in Mendham, Chris Christie's hometown, by the way, and a longtime Republican stronghold, and here's what this voter had to say about how he'll be voting this year. I'm registered Republican. I have never voted Democrat, ever. But I have a feeling this year, in the 11th Congressional District, I will be voting Democrat. So tell us, who's the candidate wooing at least one voter in Mendham, and are you hearing that sentiment a lot in the district from people like that guy? The candidate is Mikey Sherrill, 46 years old a former Navy helicopter pilot, a uh, former federal prosecutor out of the Newark uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, um, a mom of four kids. Uh, the Democrats could not have dreamed up a better candidate for this district. And this is one of the things we're going to be doing an episode on uh, the podcast about is taking a look, comparing Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor in Georgia, with Mikey Sherrill running for Congress, uh, in New Jersey, um, two very different strategies, two very different candidates. Um, and uh, she's facing Jay Weber, who is one of the most conservative assemblymen uh, in the state legislature. He has uh, voted against uh, gay marriage, gay rights, uh, Planned Parenthood, very, you know, f firmly pro, I mean, anti-abortion. Um, he voted against this one. She's really uh, beating him up on, and I and I think you know this is a big problem for him. Is that he was one of only two legislators in both the Assembly and the Senate in New Jersey who voted against the Equal Pay for Equal Work bill that was just this year. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that's she's advertising on that issue. That is a problem, and her advertise. You know, she's raised a ton of money nationally and she's got a bunch of ads up and running and I was out with her on Sunday we we're walking through a street fair in Caldwell and people were mobbing her and um, and she's um, she's very telegenic uh, and they've seen her ads so now they're recognizing her and um, and people are just coming up wanting selfies telling her they're voting for her um, now Jay Weber wasn't there I wasn't able to see how he would have been treated there so that's not quite fair for me to say but um, she's got quite a, a tailwind behind her at this point point. and one fascinating aspect of the 11th congressional district is how many people actually seem to care about the race a new poll says engagement is way up, and that means, um, I guess, 
likely or people who say they're likely voters or that they're very closely or somewhat closely following the race. A Monmouth poll found 71 percent of people in that district, which is unbelievable number for any midterm election in one congressional district saying they're closely, very closely or somewhat closely following the race. So here is that Democratic candidate, Mikey, Mikey Sherrill, on pre-election engagement. I've talked to people in this district who in the past didn't even really know who was going to be on the ballot until they walked into the polling booth. So um, I think this kind of engagement for this area is something new and it's what gives me so much hope for the country to see people kind of taking their responsibility to our democracy more seriously, um, really focusing on the candidates and the issues and getting engaged and then the best part is they're modeling that now for their kids. Yeah, I was with, as I said, I was with her on Sunday. We were leaving the Caldwell Fair when I asked her, after watching her, you know, just be mobbed by people, and I said, so what do you make of that? Um, and this, that was her answer, was that she was excited to see the engagement. Um, there is, you know, we've also been reporting in, uh, uh, for the last year and a half on the grassroots activists, the Trump resistance movement that turned into a midterm flip the house movement um, in these uh, New Jersey suburban districts. And uh, they're out in force um, in a story that we're going to be running soon. I, I give the detail of uh, just the town of Livingston, Chris, Chris Christie's hometown, uh, not exactly what you think of as a democratic base or bastion. Uh, in the town of Livingston, the town team for the grassroots group NJ 11th for Change has 100 people on its email list um, who are volunteering on the campaign. Um, and I've been out to some of these events and uh, the level of engagement and activism among middle-aged, middle-class, educated white women in these two districts, the 7th and the 11th, uh, is like nothing I have ever seen in my career as a reporter for 30 years. So we heard Mikey Sherrill. Now we're going to hear uh, Weber, the Republican candidate, because one of the big issues in the district is taxes, specifically the Republican tax cut bill passed last year. Sherrill is campaigning against it. Weber has been using it as a selling point. And here, here is Weber on NJTV making his case for why the tax cuts are great for New Jersey families, despite losing that deduction on state and local taxes above $10,000. It was part of a larger tax package that benefits the residents of the 11th Congressional District more than any other district in the state of New Jersey. There's a $6,000 tax cut that the average family of four in this district gets because of that tax reform package. So how would you guess the tax issue is dividing people? Is it by their personal finances? Like, you have to get a decent income or own enough of a home to pay more than $10,000 in state and, local in uh, state and local taxes in the first place. But then upper income people some of those same people get a break in other ways. Yeah, I mean, I think there are gonna be some people who look at the equation and say, okay, they, they're, they like the tax cut. Uh, but, you know, I'm telling you, those are needle in a haystack folks. You go out and you talk to people in New Jersey and what they are mad about is the loss of the property tax deduction on their federal income taxes. So, you know, property taxes, particularly in the 11th and the 7th district, are very high. And so you're talking about a property tax bill that is, you know, upwards over $20,000 a year. And the new tax law allows you to only deduct the first 10. And so that's, that's raising people's taxes. And it's raising it in a way that really gets people's goats because they're mad about their property tax. They're frustrated. They want them to go down. They've wanted them to go down for 20, 30 years, and not one politician has been able to, to fix this problem. So, um, you know, think about it. If your tax bill is more than your mortgage payment uh, every month, uh, which mine is, it's very frustrating. Um, so, so this is a so this is an issue, and what's interesting about this issue, um, and you know, Mikey Sherrill's talking about it a lot. Tom Malinowski's talking about it. The Democrat in District Seven. What's interesting about this issue is is that Republicans have always been able to uh, make a case that they're for lower taxes, and 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 they've been able to win on that issue. And right now, Trump's tax bill has just 
wiped out that issue for them. They cannot effectively argue it. And so what you see in the 11th district is, and the reason why I said that Mikey Sherrill is such a good candidate for this district, it's not because, oh, I just like her, it's because she's a veteran. and and she's able to go out and talk about this tax bill. And those two issues, she's just killing Weber on those issues. So she's, those are meat and potato issues for Republicans, and he has been gutted on them. Redistribution of wealth from blue states to red states, right? <laughs> from states yeah. with a lot of wealthy urban areas. Of course, there's a lot of poverty in urban areas too, but they also have some of the greatest concentrations of wealth. Um, two more rural states. Kind of that point, I was reading a stat over the weekend that this the Senate, uh, as we look at the fate of Supreme Court justices and you know politics in general, the 51 Republican senators represent 40 million fewer Americans than the 49 Democratic senators, and that's because you know small population rural states get two senators just like New York and California and Texas. Um, and so, in a way, the Senate is pre-gerrymandered by the United States Constitution. Well, I mean, the Senate was created to preserve slavery. I mean, that was, that's the idea in the first instance. And um, I think what's interesting is that w w you both when you're thinking about the Senate and people having this kind of conversation, like, is the Senate a legitimate body? You know, I mean, that that's a genuine conversation people are having now. And I think the same thing you're going to see with the Supreme Court after Brett Kavanaugh. Um, you know, is one of the hallmarks of the Trump era is it sort of began with every with with people who uh, who were terrified of his presidency, saying our institutions will save us. We just got to believe in our institutions, and it's arrived at a point where people are like, well, maybe our institutions are the problem, and we need to fix them. Maybe they don't have quite the legitimacy that we thought they had. Um, I think the same kind of conversation we were we are likely to see around the act of voting. Um, you know, I mean, the the there are a number of races where you know I take the Georgia governor's race right now. Now, uh, where it is literally a referendum on voting rights. You know, I mean, you have uh, the woman who is running for governor, it was Stacey Abrams. She was vying to be the first uh, black woman ever elected governor in the in the country. Uh, she has spent most of her career trying to fight for voting rights for uh, for people of color and young people in Georgia, versus Brian Kemp, who has spent much of his career uh, arguing that voter fraud is a problem and trying to police the act of voting. There are races like that all over the country where, it, where it's becoming a referendum on democracy itself. So I think that, that is another interesting subset of this, of this political moment is that you're, you're in a place where a growing number of people who once sort of just looked at our institutions as sacrosanct, as the thing that would save us, are now saying, well, maybe we need to do something about these institutions themselves. Yeah. And with echoes of history from episode two, of this season of your podcast, United States of Anxiety. You explore how Anita Hill's testimony during, of course, the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearing affected women who ran for office in that following year, 1992, and you spoke with Carol Mosley Braun, the first black woman to win a seat in the Senate. When she was on the campaign trail, the Anita Hill controversy complicated things for her, as she tells in this story. Being both black and female, I had to go into the black churches and understand that this was not something they wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it took one of my campaign workers to really draw the picture for me to make it make some sense to me. We were sitting up in a church one day and he pointed to the, the church. The choir was behind all the preachers and all the preachers, the pastors were all male and the choir was almost entirely female. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's why the Nita Hill's not getting more support than she is in the black community. And that was true. Echoes for someone like Stacey Abrams? Yeah, I mean, I was I have to say I was surprised when um, when Colonel Mosey Brown said that to me. I, that is not the answer I expected to hear from her. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it just points to a couple things. It points to how complicated all this stuff can be, you know, um, the sort of the mix of race and gender and identity uh, is a big part of our politics. Um, and it doesn't always track as simply as we would like, like it to track, you know. Um, uh, and so black men in particular had trouble believing <laughs> uh, Anita Hill because of misogyny in the black community. <laughs> and, 
and and you know, and and, and uh, there's been a lot of conversation now about Susan Collins as the uh, you know as the, the decisive vote in Brett Kavanaugh, and what does that mean for Republican women yeah. uh, at a time when women are saying uh, that that we have we are trying to claim, claim political power. So it, it 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 I think she what her story to me really speaks to is the way that we, it's not as simple as demographics in this. We're gonna, mm -hmm. th th there there are some some cross currents. And so here's a clip of a Republican woman from the Senate in that same episode of United States of Anxiety. It's Nancy Kassebaum, a Republican from Kansas, who served in the Senate from 1979 to 1997. Um, and she, uh, well, she, she talks about this one aspect of being in her role. And I was asked a lot of times, what's it like being one a only woman or one of a few? Do people view you as too weak? Are you strong enough? I said, if I worried about all those kind of things, I'd never get anything done. I have to say the hour I spent talking to, to Nancy Landon Kassenbaum was one of the best hours of my life. She was such a delight. Um, and. Uh, and you know, I, I think what was one of the things we did in this is when, when we sat down and started the season, we were like, you know, there we could talk, you, we could just about talk to a majority of the women who have ever served in the United States Senate. That's how few have, and 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 we and we, we forget that in 1991, when Anita Hill was testifying, there were two women, Nancy Landon Kassenbaum and Barbara McCallsey in the United States Senate. There had ever been 13 in all of American history. There had been 13 women in the body. Um, uh, and uh, that election uh, was, uh, the, the election that followed that uh, changed American politics. It absolutely did. The, the, the number of women that came in, four more women came into the Senate, something like 20-something women came into the House. Uh, it was easily the, the largest number of women that had come into uh, federal office. Uh, and, and it has continued to grow since then. And the question then in 2018 becomes, uh, you know, is this another reset? There are a record number of women running for office, a record number of women won their primaries. Um, uh, is this another massive reset in terms of the demographics of our elected officials? And so one more clip, and then we're going to run out of time. Um, <laughs> and this is maybe a surprise. Former Republican governor of New Jersey, Christy Todd Whitman, is talking about how immigration, which we don't usually think of in terms of gender, is becoming a woman's issue in this election and how it may hurt Republicans. When they see children being torn away from their parents at the border, or they see children and their parents being incarcerated in an effort by the administration to extend that, they're not comfortable with that. The party, I think, is going to have to change its rhetoric quite a bit, moderate a little bit. Nancy Solomon, She's, that's from your New Jersey reporting. She is fighting to, uh, to keep the moderate wing of the Republican Party alive. Um, and I will note she is, has endorsed Leonard Lance. Um, she's a big fan of the Problem Solvers Caucus in uh, the House, uh, which jo Josh Gottheimer, uh, the Democrat from the Bergen County uh, seat, is, uh, is one of the co-chairs of. Um, that she's, she's making the argument, yes, that, that the Republican Party has got to moderate on these issues or they're gonna lose women. And, and Kelly Dimmar brought this up too, that it, it doesn't serve the interests. If, if what we want is gender parity in our leadership, uh, then we don't want to see a Democratic Party of women and a Republican Party of uh, women and people of color and a, Demo and a Republican Party of white men. What we want to see are, are female Republicans running and winning and being part of that mix. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to say that um, Governor Whitman is, that's her fight. And, and she's looking at reforming the system of how we elect independents because she and her fellow moderate Republicans have been so uh, completely taken out of power of their party. And, and yet the system for independence is very difficult and they're looking at reforming that so that they can resurrect themselves. Our New Jersey Public Radio Managing Editor, Nancy Solomon, 
and Kai Wright and listeners and folks here in the green space, I did promise one clip that we're not going to actually be able to get to, uh, a deep history clip that you will just have to go to Kai's podcast, The United States of Anxiety, and listen to for yourself of the first woman ever elected to Congress uh, Jeanette Rankin in 1916. There was no radio yet in 1916, <laughs> but there is audio of her telling the story of that first election um, from um, a number of years later in the new episode that uh, just dropped today on the podcast United States of Anxiety. Please thank Kai Wright and Nancy Solomon. Thanks, Brian. Brian Lehrer on WNYC. Much more to come live from the green space. Hi, I'm Allison Stewart, host of WNYC's new show, All of It. On the next All of It, actor Michael Shannon has more than 80 screen credits to his name and many more in theater. We'll talk to him about what he's going to add to that list. Plus, Nona Hendricks, formerly of the trio LaBelle, will be here to talk activism, James Brown, and her prolific music career spanning decades. Join me for All of It with Allison Stewart, weekdays at noon on WNYC. Support for WNYC comes from the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, presenting an evening of vocal jazz with Gregory Porter and Diane Reeves, November 8th at 8 p.m., part of the 7th Annual T.D. James Moody Jazz Festival. Tickets at njpac.org. Manhattan Theatre Club's new play, India Pale Ale, In the Heartland, a second-generation Punjabi-American woman faces an impossible choice. Follow the dream that calls her or stay with the family that needs her. Tickets at indiapalealeplay.com. Mike's Tech Shop, an Apple-authorized service provider located in Chelsea, offering data recovery for Mac and iPhone, managed services, open box sales, and more. Information at mikestechstop.com or 212-924-MIKE. Join New York Public Radio's Community Advisory Board for a conversation with Jen Chung and Jake Dobkin, co-founders of Gothamist, tonight at 7 in the Green Space. Details at 646-829-4000 or wnyc.org slash cab. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live from the green space today, our ground floor theater here at 160 Varick Street. And when we're doing the show from the green space, you can watch as well as listen as we stream live video at WNYC.org. Check it out if you want to see the faces behind the voices. And the next voice up is WNYC's Yasmin Khan, back with us now as part of WNYC's and Gothamist's Ask a Reporter series. Yaz has been answering questions that you submit about civic engagement in the election season and beyond. Some recent ones are, how can I become civically engaged without risking my immigration status? How to go about changing New York's abysmal voting laws? And how can I get a mural for an outdoor wall in my neighborhood? Build that mural. Build that mural. <laughs> Yaz even brought some New York City murals for Green Space audience members and those of you video streaming uh, to see, go to WNYC.org. Again, there, there it is, WNYC.org, if you want to get onto the video stream. Hi, Yasmin Khan. Hello. Good morning. And listeners, we'll put out three audience questions around this. Number one, how would you like to see New York's or New Jersey's voting laws change? Number two, describe a mural in your neighborhood and how it got there. And number three, tell us how you got civically or politically involved this year and what motivated you. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692 on any of those things. And Yaz, what are some of the bad things you discovered about New York State's voting law and how should people advocate for reform? Yeah, well, it's no secret, really, um, how New York um, is really kind of behind a lot of other states. Um, but you may not have a frame of reference for this unless you voted somewhere else. So if you've only voted in New York, you may not realize that early voting means that in 37 other states, um, at, you can go and cast a ballot, basically, at a site before Election Day. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean... Um, you know, mailing a ballot. I talked to a couple of friends about this, and they did not realize that you could actually go and cast a ballot somewhere ahead of election day. Um, so that's that's a big one. New York does not have early voting. New York does not have same day registration, voter registration. New York does not have automatic voter registration, which is another method of of sort of basically 
getting people automatically registered when they interact with government agencies like the DMV or something like that, um, that's becoming more popular now and has um, shown to increase uh, voter registration. It's like basically instead of opting in, you would have to opt out. Um, you, you cannot pre-register 16 and 17 year olds to vote, um, which is something that is happening in a few other states. Uh, you can though, if you are 17 and you're gonna have a birthday by November 6th, you can register to vote. Um, there are just a lot of quirky ways that New York is sort of behind the times. And there is a package of bills in the state legislature that is so far stuck in the state legislature yeah. that would do a lot of the things you just mentioned. Absolutely. There was even uh, Cuomo in his budget proposal last year, well, this at the beginning of this calendar year, um, even um, had funding for early voting. Um, and these bills have passed the assembly, but they have stalled in the Republican-controlled Senate. Um, you talk to Democratic sen state senators, and they very loudly proclaim that it's Republicans who uh, fear that uh, increasing voter access will will basically threaten their power. Um, and, so, and so they block it. And it's one of the reasons that control of the New York State Senate is one of the big stories uh, that's in play yeah. this election year. And we should mention and mention and mention again that under the current voting laws, this Friday is the deadline to register to vote. That's right. In New York State. It's the deadline to register to vote. It's also, and this is another way that New York's voting laws um, are a little bananas, um, this, this Friday is the deadline to register, to uh, actually to change your party affiliation for next year's primaries. You have to change your party affiliation almost a year in advance in New York. Um, so it gets confusing to talk about because obviously the November 6th election, you don't, it doesn't matter your party affiliation. But if you were someone that wanted to change your affiliation to, uh, for the June primaries that just happened or the September primaries, people learn the hard way that you had to do this really far in advance in New York. You know who just did that this week before the deadline in New York? Michael Bloomberg. All right. He changed his registration to Democrat. So that presumably, are you applauding Democrats or Bloomberg? Uh, <laughs> this is presumably so he can run in Democratic presidential primaries. That's right. And this was a problem, I believe, um, for Donald Trump's own children, that they could not vote for him in the New York primary because they had to have changed their party affiliation to Republican and they missed the deadline, some of them, really. Last week on Ask a Reporter, you were asked this question. I want to campaign to turn a really horrible, big gray wall in my neighborhood into a mural. How can I get that process started? Now, we have some of the murals, Green Space yeah. audience. We've now put this up on the video monitors here. And again, listeners out in Radioland, you can live stream video of this, if you so choose, at WNYC.org. So, Yasmin, first, talk about the, the question in general and yeah. why you asked it give people time to get to the video stream, and then we'll talk about some of these cool murals. Yeah, so this came from um, a listener reader in Brooklyn. Her name is Ruth Spencer. And I loved this question because it, it's not just about beautifying a space, and there are a lot of parts of New York that need some sprucing up here and there. Um, but to, to really create a mural in your neighborhood, you have to have a whole community-driven process. So. Uh, the mural process is about kind of just getting together with your neighbors. You have to do some community organizing um, because a lot of people are going to be looking at murals um, and you need input from people about what they want to see, about themes that they want, um, you know, realized um, in a piece of public art. And obviously that process will vary in size depending on where the mural is. If you have a mural under you know, by a, by a busy transit area that's going to involve a larger community process, then maybe you want a mural over a community garden or something like that. And you want to talk to all the people that live in, on the block um, to, to make sure that they have a say, basically. All right. What's this mural we're looking so at So this right mural now? is actually part um, of, there, there is a project called the New York City Mural Arts Project. It is a, um, basically it's, it's, part of a de the Department of Health, and it's the idea is to reduce um, the stigma around mental illness. So this is a 
specific type of project, community, broader community participation happens, but um, they work with, uh, the Department of Health works with community-based organizations specifically related um, to mental illness, and there's a, usually a core group of people that um, come up with themes and ideas for the art, and then the larger community is brought in. So this is a mural in the Bronx. I can't tell you exactly where. Um, the Department of Health just passed this on to me. We can look at the next one, too. There are a couple of... Um, Department of Health murals in this. Um, this mural is uh, actually one done by uh, an organization called Creative Artworks. There are a few different organizations that um, that help the community through the mural process. Um, you can uh, you can do this with an individual street artist or artist also, but um, there are organizations that specifically do murals. Creative Artworks is one of them, and. I love this story because this is in Inwood, in a place called Isham Alley. So this, um, does, does anybody know that space? Um, so this mural is on a, on a private wall. And for a long time, apparently, um, the property owner, the private owner, let an artist use this wall um, to put up murals um, over the course of a few years. And about five years ago or so, um, I guess this artist put up something that was kind of provocative and offensive to some people. It was anti-corporate, anti-NYPD. So the, the NYPD has an anti-graffiti task force or squad or whatever. They came and painted over it in black. And this, this um, wall, it's a private wall, but it abuts uh, p city park land, this little area. So the city parks department would not let anyone cross their land to repaint something. They said, if you want a mural, you have to have a community process, basically. So they went to the community board, the Girl Scouts at one point got involved, the community board and the Girl Scouts turned to this organization, Creative Artworks, and said, do something that involves community input. Um, they came up with this design. Young people helped design and paint it and actually do the art. And the building owner, it turned out that the wall was... Um, needed so so many repairs to even put paint on it. So the, the owner at his own expense fixed up the wall and now you have this mural that really involved basically the, a property owner, a community board, neighbors, the Girl Scouts. And this is a pretty good example of how you, it can take a, a good amount of effort, but when you have a lot of people coming together, you have a, a project that is really representative of a community. I want to take a phone call from a murals fan and he's not even in New York. Here is Bill, well, now he's in New York, in Yorkville, you're on WNYC. Hi, Bill. Bill, you there? Oh, yeah, Brian, hi. Um, absolutely love your show. I'm happy I have a day off and I can listen live, and uh, I really love the topic. Um, I was telling your screener, I've been uh, living between Philly, Jersey City, and New York for the past you know, 12, 13 years. Uh -huh. It, Philadelphia, as you and I'm sure your guest knows, has a spectacular uh, city-funded, city-backed mural arts program. There are over 5,000 murals in the city. I really became obsessed with them at that time. And, you know, since then, I was fortunate to live in Jersey City for a couple of years where there's now a very burgeoning um, and pretty impressive now sort of city-backed program to put murals around the city and sort of some independent uh, pushes as well. So I, I just wanted to mention, too, that I really love. Um, one, and I think it's really in keeping with, I guess, the community-minded and civic-oriented spirit of these things, I guess, in, in, uh, you know, in, in its greatest spirit. Uh, it's mm -hmm. on the corner of 3rd and Coles. It's a community center. There's this little uh, sort of garage door front. You know, when it's open, you know, people are doing, you know, their dance classes and yoga and things like that behind the door. Every few months, the, it's a small and humble mural. It changes without fanfare. Um, my favorites have been one, it was like this really bright pastel colored thing in the dead of winter. It was nice to see that every day when I went to my car. And another one was this really surreal thing. I was telling the screener, I, my guess was that the artist was trying to channel like psychedelic era beetles. There were these men in pit hats with, uh, and there were four of them and they had these squint faces and pointing to a, like a, I thought an imagined map of, of East Asia. Um, one other, since you know we're talking about New York, there's a, a graffiti artist named uh, Futura Dos Mil. He's been around since the 70s. He still puts things up periodically. And on 106 Bayard in uh, Williamsburg, there's an amazing corner where two buildings meet, um, a bright, stunning orange gradient and just sort of a, a sea of polka dots. 
Uh, it's been there for years. It's been a little while since I went, but um, Great. that one I think is really beautiful. Good tips. Bill, thank you so much for checking, checking us out. I uh, hope you have a lot more days off <laughs> so you can listen to the show. Yes, we're going to run out of time. Um, just tell people one more time, now that we've covered a few of the things that you've been doing in the Ask, Report, Ask a Reporter series, how people can ask a question and what you have coming up. Go to wnyc.org slash askareporter. Um, you can also tweet at me. Uh, and right now, um, in fact, right after this, I have an interview with the um, Department of Sanitation Commissioner to talk about litter. We want to talk about what people can do to keep their blocks tidy and to organize their neighbors to do so, too. Cool. WNYC's Yasmin Khan. And this is WNYC FM HD and AM New York, WNJT FM 88.1 Trenton, WNJP 88.5 Sussex, WNJY 89.3 Netcong, and WNJO 90.3 Toms River. We are New York and New Jersey Public Radio, where it's time for the latest news live from the Green Space Stage with Richard Hake. Thanks. Hurricane Michael's getting stronger and it's aiming for the Florida Panhandle. The National Hurricane Center is warning that this Category 4 hurricane will bring catastrophic damage with winds powerful enough to peel off roofs and cause the complete destruction of homes. Florida Governor Rick Scott says the storm could also bring storm surge of up to 14 feet. Along our coast, communities are going to, be see, are going to see unimaginable devastation. Think about the devastation we've seen before with storms like Hurricane Irma. The Panhandle and Big Bend will see winds in excess of 145 miles per hour. Scott says this morning that he's scared to death that people ignored evacuation orders. This is the most powerful storm on record to hit this area, so powerful that it's expected to remain a hurricane as it moves over land into Georgia early tomorrow. Mayor de Blasio has signed legislation creating a third gender designation for New Yorkers who don't identify as a man or woman. Starting January 1st, residents will be able to change their gender on their birth certificates to Gender X. Michael Adams is the CEO of SAGE, a group of advocates for LGBTQ seniors. He says many people have been waiting for this for decades. It was transgender and gender nonconforming activists who launched our modern movement at Stonewall. That was almost 50 years ago. And so those activists are now in their 70s and 80s. They are our elders. The law will also let people attest to their own gender on the certificates until now a letter from a doctor is needed. An incumbent state senator and his challenger met on stage last night in front of a rowdy crowd of South Brooklyn constituents. Martin Golden, Brooklyn's lone Republican senator, tried to paint his opponent, Democrat Andrew Gennardis, as soft on crime and eager to raise taxes. You are a rubber stamp for the governor and a rubber stamp for Mayor de Blasio. And we don't need another rubber stamp for Mayor de Blasio. We need somebody that's going to fight for our veterans. We need somebody that's going to fight for education. We need somebody that's going to build more classrooms and not more hotel rooms. Gernardis is a lawyer in the Brooklyn Borough President's office, and he says Golden is out of touch with his district. After 16 years of the failed status quo, our communities deserve better. It's time. It's time. Golden has been in office since 2002. In New Jersey, one of Phil Murphy's first moves as governor was to order a $1.3 million audit of NJ Transit. Now it's out and the findings are not very good. Problems plague every part of the agency from breakdowns in management to lack of planning to low morale in the workforce. The governor says NJ Transit is already carrying out some of the audit's recommendations like creating a war room for communications. I believe as we implement the recommendations of this audit, the fair paying public and NJ Transit's dedicated employees will begin to see real and noticeable improvement. Murphy says he'll hold on a fair hike until June, but after that, the agency will likely need more funding to make further improvements. And former three-term New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is officially a Democrat again. He announced the switch this morning on social media. Bloomberg has previously been a Democrat, also a Republican, and an Independent. He twice flirted with running for president as an independent candidate. His resignation now as a Democrat would be significant if he does decide to challenge President Trump. On Instagram, Bloomberg writes this morning that he made the switch to, quote, because we need Democrats to provide the checks and balances our nation so badly needs. He did not say anything about running for president. Partly sunny skies today, highs near 81 degrees. We do have a chance of showers tonight and tomorrow. Showers are likely. Some of those could produce heavy rainfall as the remnants of Hurricane Michael 
come through. Highs tomorrow near 76 degrees. That's the latest from the WNYC newsroom in the green space. I'm Richard Haig. When you donate to WNYC, you're building a strong local newsroom. As other news services are disappearing, your donation provides a source of reliable information that's here every day. You're making sure reporters around the globe are demanding answers to challenging questions. WNYC needs your help to continue building this independent resource for everyone. Make a contribution now. Call 888-376-WNYC or go to WNYC.org and click on Donate. WNYC is supported by the Netflix original film, 22 July, from the director of Captain Phillips and the Bourne Ultimatum, a true story of survivors rallying for justice and hope following a national incident, on Netflix and in select theaters Friday. WNYC's digital transformation is supported by the Jerome L. Green Foundation. Where are public meetings happening in my neighborhood? What exactly does the Attorney General do? How can I get involved without jeopardizing my immigration status? You have questions about the midterm elections, and WNYC will get you answers. Your concerns are at the heart of our politics coverage. Our reporters will cover the stories that matter to you, and will give you what you need to make smart choices when you go to the polls. Send us your questions at wnyc.org slash election. It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone, live from the Green Space, our ground floor theater here at the WNYC location at 160 Barrack Street in Lower Manhattan. We do the show from here about once a month. Uh, so if you're not here today, listen for our next time. If, uh, if you want to come, usually it's the, let's see, am I getting this right? I think it's the second Wednesday of every month is our current pattern. So look it up and you can buy tickets for whatever that day is. Uh, in November and December and January even if you want to. And when we're in the green space, we also stream live video because there are cameras installed here so you can see me and my guests. So if you want to watch the show as well as listen today, you can go to wnyc.org and uh, check out that video stream. With us now, I'm very happy to have David Miliband here in the green space. He has gone from being Britain's foreign secretary and before that environment secretary to President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, where he oversees the agency's humanitarian relief operations in more than 40 war-affected countries and its refugee settlement and assistance programs in 28 United States cities. He published a book last year called Rescue, Refugees, and the Political Crisis of Our Time. I know he's just back from Yemen, which has one of the most intense refugee crises right now. And he's here today as a point of view guest in our fall election series, 30 Issues in 30 Days. We'll actually get a more conservative view afterwards from the former Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper. The issue and the news hook in this case, Trump's recent cut in the number of refugees to be allowed into the U.S. next year to just 30,000. That would be the lowest since the year 1980. This year it's 45,000. In President Obama's last year in office, it was 110,000. David Miliband is very outspoken on this. In April, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post called On Refugees, the Trump Administration is Competent and Malevolent. But what does he really think? Audience, please welcome David Miliband to the green space. Thank you. Hello, Brian. Nice to be with you in person. We now I know that you really exist. You, uh, you're not just a disembodied voice. And now I know that you're not just your very impressive disembodied voice. What's a refugee? How, how do you know a refugee from a regular immigrant or an asylum seeker? A refugee is someone for whom it's not safe to go home. It's the baker bombed out of his bakery in Damascus. It's the girl driven out of northeast Nigeria by the Boko Haram terrorist group. Uh, an immigrant is someone who leaves their country in search of a better life. A refugee is someone who's forced to flee their country to save their life. Asylum seeker? An asylum seeker is someone who has left their country but claims refugee status not in the first country they land in but in a third country. So for example if a Syrian goes to Jordan the vast bulk of refugees will uh, register with the United Nations High Commission on Refugees in Jordan, but some of them will go on and they might claim, try and claim asylum in um, Europe, in, in Germany. The, the American example would be 
uh, someone who is fleeing gang violence in El Salvador or Guatemala, uh, they don't claim asylum next door. They make it to the United States and they claim asylum here. And when it comes to refugees, when I first read your Washington Post article, I, I thought the headline said, Trump on this is incompetent and malevolent, but it's really competent and malevolent. Why those two adjectives? Well, the uh, idea came from the uh, general commentary at the time, which was accusing the administration uh, of being incompetent as well as malevolent. And I wanted to make the point that this is for pe people often on the right were saying, were bemoaning what they perceived to be the incompetence of the administration, uh, even if they agreed with some of the policy goals. I was saying that in this area, uh, the administration has, sadly, in my view, uh, and in the view, I think, of many people, not just in the U.S., but around the world, um, started to turn down the light, the bright, shining light that America offered for the humanitarian help it offered around the world. The administration has tried to cut the amount of overseas assistance, the foreign aid that goes and that we see and that we partner with the U.S. around the world in countries like Yemen that are war-torn. But it's also uh, snuffing out this very distinctive bipartisan American program, which has had, I mean, the, the most refugees that ever came to the U.S. were under the Reagan administration in the beginning of the 1980s. And it was a bipartisan program that is well run, that achieves good results because refugees have higher levels of employment than the native-born population. They actually pay more in taxes than they take out in welfare uh, benefits. There's been no fatal uh, terrorist attacks by any refugees. That's a, a false sort of myth that's put uh, around. And so this successful bipartisan program is being uh, reduced and is in danger of being snuffed out. You, you made the point, Brian, that the cap that the administration had for the fiscal year 18, which ended on September the 30th, uh, was 45,000. But it wasn't 45,000 refugees who were allowed in. Only 22,000 were allowed in. Right. 45,000 so, was the legal cap, and they didn't even let in half that many. Exactly. And so the great fear now is that with the legal cap reduced to 30,000, the historic low, that if there's a continued um, underperformance, if you like, below the cap, then America will be down at the absolutely nougat tree uh, levels And some of the smallest European countries, I think Ireland takes 5,000 refugees. Canada famously last year took 30,000 refugees. And so uh, no one pretends that refugee resettlement, which is the organized transfer of the most vulnerable refugees, victims of torture, uh, victims of people who've, had, who've lost family members, no one pretends that the transfer of those most vulnerable people to safe countries is the answer to the refugee problem, because there are 25 million refugees around the world. But it's a very important part of an effective and comprehensive response. Of course, most refugees are in countries close to those at war. I mean, Turkey's got three and a half million Syrians. Jordan has got 650,000 Syrians. Bangladesh has just received 700,000 Rohingya Muslims in the last year. I mean, just in parenthesis, those countries don't know whether to laugh or cry when they hear Americans saying, oh, it's a crisis to have 10 or 20,000 people arrive, because these are countries that have got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, arriving, but the, the, in those countries, the vast bulk of humanitarian aid is needed to support needed to support people. Hopefully, eventually to go home, although relatively few do. But it's vital for the most vulnerable. They're able to come to some countries like the U.S. And the fact that the U.S. should be retreating is, is a source of enormous sadness, not to say anger, around the world. Can you talk a little more about the history that you referenced when you mentioned Reagan? You know, and I think about this number, um, thirty thousand being described as the lowest since 1980, and people might think, oh, yeah, well, since Reagan, you know, You know, Reagan 80s. was in the 200,000 plus. Right, so 1980 was really the last year of the Carter administration, and if that was the low, then Reagan must have increased the number of refugees. Yeah, re it, well, what you had was the passage in 1980 of the Ref 1980 Refugee Act, ah. and that brought into American law for the first time the 1951 Refugee Convention, which said that uh, a refugee so was uh, someone who had a well-founded fear of persecution, and that was put into American English and made uh, legal. And uh, then in the early 1980s, 81, 82, you had over 200,000 refugees, many of them from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, obviously, because the refugee story is partly about need, it's partly about uh, national responsibility. I mean, it's not an accident that the largest number of refugees who've ever come to the US are Vietnamese. I mean, it speaks mm. to the trauma that America uh, and Vietnam went through uh, in the 60s and uh, 70s. And the other point I think is interesting is that it's an important part of foreign policy. 
uh, to have a, a country that lives by its responsibilities and frankly holds a candle against the dictatorships and oppressive regimes around the world that do persecute people and drive them out. And it's a terrible irony at the moment that while the administration is saying that it wants to stand up for the people of Iran who want to protest against the perfidy of their own government, they won't let Iranians who are protesting and are persecuted as a result come here. And that is an important thing to recognize in all the talk that we have about conflict. Refugee status is also for those who are, have a fear of persecution, just to, to make it more relevant maybe to my organization. Remember, the International Rescue Committee is a great New York organization founded by Albert Einstein who was a refugee in the 1930s and wanted to do something to help those who were trapped in Nazi-occupied uh, Europe, and he created the International Rescue Committee. And it says something about New York. It wasn't an accident that he was in New York. He was in New York because it was an, part, an open city in an open country. And your parents were refugees, weren't they? Yeah, my parents were refugees. I mean, I look like and probably sound like the product of the longest period of peace and prosperity that Europe has ever known. And I am that product. I was born in the mid uh, 1960s, 1965. I mean, uh, I'm fighting the aging process, but losing. But the uh, um, I, I was uh, brought up in a safe and secure household in a safe and secure country. But my dad was a 16-year-old who fled Belgium in 1940. My mum fled uh, Poland in 1946 as a 12-year-old, and they were both refugees and given refugee status. Listeners, my guest is David Miliband. He's president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, which works on behalf of refugees around the world with uh, direct relief as well as advocacy, as you're hearing. We can take some phone calls for him. Um, I wonder if anybody is out there on different sides of this issue. Do you support the cut that the Trump administration is announcing for next year to 30,000 refugees max compared, say, to 110,000 that uh, the Obama administration authorized in its last year. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. And here's a clip of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in his announcement of the lower refugee cap last month. The improved refugee policy of this administration serves the national interest of the United States and expands our ability to help those in need all around the world. We will continue to assist the world's most vulnerable while never losing sight of our first duty, serving the American people. We are and continue to be the most generous nation in the world. A laugh line in the green space for Mike Pompeo. Are we the most generous nation in the world by some measures that pertain to refugees. What was Secretary of State Pompeo referring to there, as far as you can tell? Well, it's quite hard to um, find the figures to back that up. Obviously, if you look at government overseas aid, uh, the US spends about 0.17% of national income on overseas aid. A country like the UK actually spends 0.7%. We're a smaller economy, but as a, in percentage terms. Um, the U.S. spends about $8 billion a year on international humanitarian uh, aid. That makes it a large uh, donor, but there, are all, but there are other countries that are of a similar order of magnitude. And if you look at total development spending, European countries now together, if you count them together, spend more. On the refugee resettlement front, we've been through the, um, we've been through the figures. One thing I do want to say, though, is that people often say to me, uh, as an organization that's working in war zones for people affected by war, but is also resettling refugees in the US, what's it like to be leading that organization at a time of backlash? And what I always say to them is, look, whatever the political rhetoric, when we resettle refugees in Dallas or in Houston or in New York or in Boise, Idaho, there is an American generosity that comes through very, very strongly. With the neighbors who uh, live next to the refugees who settle, the first thing they do is they come and introduce themselves, they want to make them welcome, they want to teach their kids English, they want to help them get into networks, they want to explain wh how the local health system works. Uh, and so I, I don't think this is about whether or not Americans are more or less generous, it's whether or not they've got the capacity and the political will to rise to the global challenges that exist today. Because we are not talking about a cut in the number of refugees at a time when there are fewer and fewer refugees. It's really important to say that this assault on your refugee resettlement program is happening at a time when there are record numbers of refugees and displaced people around the world. And it's that contrast that is especially sad. I, I approach this with sadness rather than in anger. I moved to the US five years ago to lead the IRC. And I, one of the things I had the good fortune to oversee is a bipartisan, successful program. 
And so it's with sadness rather than anger that one listens to the attempt to justify a 75% reduction in the maximum number of refugees allowed as a generous act. And it's also important to remember that it's not like the funds from refugees are being transferred to overseas aid because the administration is trying to cut the overseas aid budget uh, as well. And the truth is, um, I, I love this quote from John Kennedy in 1962 on American Independence Day. He made this speech saying that Alexander Hamilton told his generation of Americans to think continentally, in other words, to think about the country as a whole. And JFK said, my generation, his generation of Americans, need to think intercontinentally, in other words, to think globally. Now, that's more true 50 or 60 years later because the world is that much more connected. Security problems or economic problems or health problems that start in Syria or Yemen or Afghanistan don't stay in Syria or Yemen or Afghanistan. They come around the world. And that's why I think there's a self-interested, if you like, an America first case for an overseas aid policy, not just a, a big-hearted case for an effective overseas aid policy and a refugee resettlement policy. I love when we get global perspectives on things because you didn't just call the 4th of July Independence Day, you called it American Independence Day. <laughs> yes. And one of the articles I was reading about you to prepare for this segment uh, referred to this season as Northern Autumn. <laughs> Not by me, I wouldn't have called it Northern Autumn. <laughs> I would have called it Autumn. Um, we have a couple of calls of pushback coming in. Let's take them. Anthony in Port Chester. You're on WNYC. Hi, Anthony. All right, I might have pressed the wrong button. Control room line one, Anthony in Port Chester. Anthony, yeah. hi there. We have you now. Hi, Brian. Uh, you know, I was listening to what this gentleman said, but you know what? You have a country of black people in America who those same neighbors that he was talking about in Dallas, boy, he would never even think to welcome and help. You know, you got you got refugees come from Iran, Iraq, anywhere, and American people will help them. They'll get a loan at a bank quicker or where a black person, you know, in the same financial situation couldn't get that loan. Even my parents, I grew up in Westchester County, and my parents couldn't get a loan for their house in 1966 in Westchester County. We had to go to a bank in Long Island. So, Na uh, Anthony, all, all, these, all these things being true, um, does that make you think that the United States should not take in refugees in crisis around the world? Do you think no, the plight no, of black I people in America will be any better if we don't? No, I don't, feel, I don't think that we shouldn't take refugees in. I, I still see the need. I still see what's going on in America, especially in Yemen. You know, so I don't. I just wish it was more. I just wish they were more fairer to, to, to black people in America. You know, I just wish that it was a lot better for us. You know, I'm 63 years old, you know, and yeah, my children are doing better than I did at, 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 their, at my age. You know, they, they're doing much better. It's just that it just doesn't seem fair that when you see these people come in and they open a restaurant or they open a gas station or a grocery store in, in our neighborhood, you know, and we couldn't get that same loan to, to do that. I hear you. you. Know, but you know, I'm not going to ever say that I want to be against, you know, people mm -hmm. trying to get in. I, you know, I'm, I'm appalled at, at what this government is doing. And I'm totally against anything the President Trump's doing. But I just wish that gentleman had a better perspective of what black people go through in, in, a, in this country because and, we're refugees in our own country. I hear you. Anthony, thank you so much. Let's go on to Linda on line two in Brooklyn. Hi, Linda. You're on WNYC. Hi, Brian. Thank you for taking my call. I am so in favor of immigration. I believe it helps our country in so many ways. But I live in a community that has a large Russian population. And when I interact with some of these people, they are so against immigration. They just got here. And it boggles my mind when your guest said that he was saddened. I think that's the best word I've heard because I'm very sad that people don't see the plight of others and want them to have the same advantage or the ability to, to get somewhere that they had. Can that be explained in any way? Linda, thank you. David Miliband. Well, thank you, Linda. Um, I, I agree that it's sad, obviously. Um, I haven't got an explanation, and I don't want to sort of stereotype the Russian uh, 
population um, in respect of this. But I think that there's a wider point, isn't there, which both Anthony and Linda are pointing to, which is that either you believe that you succeed at the expense of other people who are in your country, or you, expe or you believe you succeed with other people in your country. And that's an important element of the debate about the American story, really. And I think it's not about whether or not you believe in open borders. No one says that, that anyone should be able to come here. But I think that managed migration and with refugees as part of that is an essential part of the, this country's story. And if this country doesn't stand up for that idea, then very few others will. And I thought Linda was going to be pushing back herself on taking refugees. I mean, let me take on with it. There's one the argument community. that's often put, which might be in people's minds. Well, what about the security aspects, because people often say, well, hang on, is it safe to have right. people coming? In, in fact, let me play one more clip okay. of Secretary of State Pompeo in announcing this refugee cut where I think he addresses it. Already this year, we have seen evidence that the system previously in place was defective. It allowed a foreign national to slip through, who was later discovered to be a member of ISIS, as well as other individuals with criminal backgrounds. The American people must have complete confidence that everyone granted resettlement in our country is thoroughly vetted. The security checks take time, but they're critical. David Milner. Well, I've been advocating uh, exactly that we should have effective security checks. No one argues about that. And here's the irony of what Secretary Pompeo says. He says he's improved the security. So what's he got to argue that we shouldn't now let the refugees in who meet the security tests? And I think it's very important not to hide behind this security argument. After 2001, the Bush administration suspended the program for a couple of months, checked the security system, improved it, and then restarted the program. Every year, it's completely legitimate for the US government to make sure that the security vetting system is up to scratch. But now we've got an administration that says, we're confident in our security vetting system, but we still won't let people in. And that is a contradiction which is just unconscionable really, because it takes away that fundamental uh, excuse that was being used before, that somehow the security uh, justified it. Remember, even Iraqis and Afghans who've worked for the US military and for US diplomats, who've stood side by side with US generals in war zones as their translators, even they are not being allowed in. So there are 100,000 Iraqis who have helped in some way or another the US diplomats or the US uh, forces. They fear for their own lives because they might be targeted for helping the US. And now, in the last uh, year, you, we've got evidence that about only about 650 Iraqis have been allowed in, even though they've proven themselves of value to the US government. Let me ask you about another aspect of this. I was reading um, the pro-Trump nationalist news site Breitbart, which does a lot of articles on this refugee cap, has done a lot of articles on the refugee cap, uh, which explicitly or implicitly support the idea. And um, here are a couple of the angles. Um, they write, refugee settlements to the US, citing Reuters, from countries with known Islamic terrorist problems has greatly dropped. For example, about 250 Somali refugees have been resettled. At this time during 2016, under Obama, about 8,300 Somali refugees had been allowed to resettle across the country. This represents a 97% decrease in refugee settlement yep. from Somalia, which Breitbart frames as a country with a known Islamic terrorist problem. Another Breitbart article points out that the percentage of Muslims among the refugees being settled in the United States now has dropped from a majority to a minority, and now 70% of the refugees being settled in the U.S. are Christians. Well, Do let's you know be, that to be well, true? Yeah, let's just be clear about this. Three, three points. Number one. The reduction in the number of refugees has hit the Muslim numbers hard, about an 80% reduction. But what's happened to the number of Christians being allowed in? That's been reduced by about 60% as well. So this is hitting Christians as well as Muslims. So fewer Second, Christians as well, but now Christians are a majority if these numbers are right. Yeah. Um, second, and remember, we're a secular organization. We say people should get entry on the basis of need, not on the basis of religion. It's an absolutely fundamental uh, part of that. How is need distributed by religion today? Is well, it easy to say? It's hard to say. I think that um, it's, I, if I had to guess, I would say now the number of refugees, you're talking about 45 to 50 percent Muslim. Uh, the number of internally displaced, which is a rather different number, there's 40 million internally displaced, 25 million refugees, it would be a slightly uh, lower number. So, but, but number one, the number of Christians being allowed in is down. Number two, 
which is the religious group that has been that has lost the most lives as a result of jihadist terrorism? Muslims. More Muslims have been killed by jihadists than have than Christians or Jews. Third point, it's a terrible mistake of foreign policy to blame a population for their own government or their own rebel or, or the rebel group that's incubated in their own country. Are we saying that all Afghans are responsible for the development of al-Qaeda in that country? That would be a heartless thing to say, but it would also be a stupid thing to say, because what we actually need is Afghans who suffer the most to be mobilized against the incubation of terrorist groups in their own country. I've just come back from Yemen. A, a war for that's been fought for the last three and a half years after a coup against the government. The Saudi-led coalition, which the American government and the UK are supporting, has run 18,000 bombing raids in that country. 83% of the population are now living in extreme poverty. 7,500 civilians have been killed. There's a separate argument about how to get out of that, but listen to this. Which are the groups that are benefiting? Who's winning the war in Yemen? Not the Saudi-led coalition, not the Houthis they're opposing. The people who are winning are precisely the terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, who we're most afraid of, who are going to find a new bridgehead in Yemen. And so I think it's really important not to fall for this argument that somehow we're fighting the fight against ISIS by stopping refugees coming here. If you listen to someone like Mike Hayden, the former head of the CIA in the Bush administration, he'll explain to you actually this is hindering the attempt to fight ISIS because it's harder to get into trusted intelligence sources if Muslims feel that their own religion is being damned by an American government policy. I, on Yemen, I'm also seeing, or I saw at least one article, in which the disappearance of that Saudi journalist, Khashoggi, and Washington Post columnist, which he also was, who is now feared dead, um, that mentioned in the same breath as Yemen. Is there a reason for that? Well, it would be mentioned in the same breath because Saudi Arabia is alleged to have killed the journalist, and Saudi Arabia is the leading uh, actor in the Yemen uh, fight, in the war in uh, Yemen. It's important to say that the Saudis say, rightly say, that the Houthis shouldn't send missiles into Saudi Arabia. That's true. But equally, it's wrong for the Saudis to have bombed a coach of schoolchildren that killed 54 people in August in northern uh, Yemen. And 7,500 civilian casualties, the vast bulk have been from the Saudi-led coalition, by the way, with American arms um, uh, supplies. So that's why they're being mentioned in the same breath. What you have is a roiling Middle East at the moment. We know about the Syria crisis, 7 million refugees. Uh, the uh, 7 million internally displaced and 5 million refugees. We know about Yemen. We also know that we're still living with the reverberations of the Arab Spring of 2011-12. Uh, and I fear that this crisis in Yemen is going to become an enormous source of regional destabilization because it pits... Saudi Arabia on one side, trying to regain power for their own supporters, against the Iranians, who have come in to back the Houthi side. So you've got all of the ingredients of a very, very dangerous regional situation. And to back up on that even one more step, and maybe even put on your foreign, uh, former UK foreign minister hat, what are the implications if the Saudi government ordered Khashoggi killed and do you lay it at the feet of Trump at all for ceasing to have the United States comment on human rights among countries he sees as friendly, uh, which would definitely include Saudi Arabia at this moment, especially the closeness of the king with Jared Kushner? Well, this uh, journalist, it's important to understand, is an American resident. So it's not just that he's written for American papers. He's got newspapers. He's got Washington Post. He's got the... Um, he's got residency uh, status. And when I said earlier in the conversation that it was important to remember that the refugee crisis is about people who suffer persecution, not just victims of wars in large uh, numbers, it's very important to recognize that this Khashoggi case may be a very good example of that. that. Now, the great danger when a country like the U.S., says it's giving carte blanche to countries around the world to do whatever they want inside their own borders... That is not a recipe for international order. That is a recipe for international anarchy. And I just want to link, if you don't mind, I know someone wants to come in and speak, but just give me a Please. second to say this. We're living in a world where there's an alleged murder of a Saudi um, dissident in a consulate in Turkey. In my own home country, the Russians have tried to kill a British citizen, a former officer. We've got the Russians hacking into the chemical weapons uh, convention um, uh, headquarters in uh, Geneva. We've got a situation where the danger of international anarchy is real. 
And it's vital that countries like the US that are meant to be anchors of the global order recognize that the peace and prosperity we had after 1945 was built on states' rights, but it was also built on human rights. That was what changed after 1945. In contrast, the preceding hundreds of years of human history, the international order had two foundation stones in the UN Charter, and if we're not careful, we're gonna lose that. We have the former Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, standing by, who's gonna have a, another point of view on a lot of immigration-related stuff, migration-related stuff, I believe. Um, but last thought from you, because the UK, as you well know, is struggling right now to finalize terms of its Brexit from the European Union. That's our national trauma. <laughs> and it's still very contentious uh, regarding whether other Europeans will have anything more than the same travel and immigration rights as people from anywhere else in the world that's not in Europe. But I read that Brexit would affect their immigration, regular immigration, but not the UK's refugee policy. And so relevant to your work, I'm just curious if that's the case and how they do refugees compared to us in the UK. Well, in short, that's true because your refugee policy is a function of the signature of the International Convention on Refugees. Your immigration policy can change. Uh, it has a, uh, has a very different legal status. Obviously, the UK... Uh, voted to leave the European Union. is try The government have been promising for two years to figure out a negotiating position. But if any of you have tried to unscramble eggs, you will have an indication of what it's like to try and withdraw from the Europe, for Britain to withdraw from the European Union. Because we have 43 years, 45 years in fact, of detailed social, economic, environmental integration with the rest of the European Union. And the struggle at the moment is how to how to do that. Are they having the same refugees and potential terrorism debate in the UK that we're he having here? No, the, 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 the government, uh, I'm afraid, is, is following a similar policy to the Trump administration in that it's reducing the number of uh, refugees who are being allowed in, including child refugees, which is particularly uh, appalling. Uh, but interestingly enough, it's not really uh, done, it's not really argued on the security uh, grounds. That is much less part of the uh, debate. Please thank the President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Stephen Harper next. Stay with us. Record numbers of black women are running for office, but is the Democratic Party ready to support them? I ghosted the DNC when I noticed there were a lot of systemic issues not being addressed as far as opportunities for black women. The DNC and getting black women a seat at the table. I'm Tanzina Vega, and that's next time on The Takeaway, weekday afternoons at 3 on 93.9 FM. WNYC supporters include the Performing Arts Center, Purchase College, American String Quartet, and novelist Salman Rushdie collaborate to present The Enchantress of Florence during this evening of spoken word and music, October 13, 8 p.m., artscenter.org. John Thurer Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center, part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hackensack Meridian Health Partnership. Learn how John Thurer Cancer Center is pioneering the possible at jtcancercenter.org. Mohonk Mountain House, located in the Hudson Valley, family-owned since 1869, the resort offers farm-to-table dining, a full spa, and 85 miles of hiking trails. Mohonk.com. This is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820. NPR News and the New York Conversation. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space today. And I'll say one more time for those of you who just tuned in recently, when we do the show from the green space, you can watch as well as listen as we stream live video. You can just go to our website, wnyc.org, and watch the radio show. So Canadian and conservative are not usually words you hear together in this country. But my next guest is the conservative who was the Canadian prime minister from 2006 to 2015. Now, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper has written a book that in large measure seeks to explain Trumpism to people in the United States, not something he supports altogether, 
but more than you might think for a Canadian, and his observations are really interesting. His book is called Right Here, Right Now, Politics and Disruption in the uh, Politics, correct me. And leadership. And leadership in, in the, the age, age of, uh, of disruption. Of disruption, forgive me. Mr. Prime Minister, we're happy to have you. Welcome to WNYC yeah. and the Green Space. Thank you. You wrote that Donald Trump was elected because many Americans were not doing so well yeah. in the world that conservatives created after the Cold War. What kind of a conservative world was that? Sure. First of all, I would maybe modify your introduction a little bit to say that the book is, is certainly much broader than the Trump phenomenon. Um, and, and to kind of give some background, I look at this from two perspectives. I'm currently chairman of my own international business consulting firm, so I advise businesses on how to deal with increasing political instability and mm -hmm. uncertainty. And also I'm chair of something called the IDU, which is the Global Federation of Conservative Parties. So through that, I've been observing trends over the past couple of years, and I see a lot of commonalities. They're not identical, but between sort of tr the rise of Trump, between Brexit, between the various populist movements that you have across Europe and other, and other, parts, of the, uh, and other parts of the world. And um, as I go on to say, I certainly don't um, by any means uh, exclusively blame conservatives for um, uh, the problems that we are having, but I would simply observe that in the really the modern era, which I kind of date from the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, the post-Cold War era, the era of globalization, you've had the spread of free markets, free trade, freer movement of people, and um, you know, on the one hand, um, it's been a very successful period. A billion people moved out of poverty. There's been nothing like it in human history, but we also know that in many Western countries, and Canada, frankly, is, is a bit of an exception, but in many Western countries, much of the middle and working class uh, have seen stagnant or declining uh, incomes for a range of reasons. Um, and then I think what happened, my kind of analysis of this, is that you had the global financial crisis. Uh, you know, you'd had an era where people had been conditioned, the idea of, you know, markets kind of govern economics, people have a degree of personal responsibility, et cetera, and then lo and behold, governments come in and bail out the wealthy and banks and major corporations, and for the rest of the people, there's a very slow recovery or none at all. And so I think that has all kind of led to the current politi political disruption we're seeing, combined with automation and job displacement, a number of other things. And so liberals would blame conservatives for that, yeah. for allowing corporations and the richest among us to write the ro modern rules of the economy, leading to an obscene concentration of wealth and some of the ill effects that you just described. As a conservative... Yeah, yeah I, would, I, would, I would not say it's necessarily that simple. For instance, the conservative argument in this country would be if you actually look at the financial deregulation that was done by the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Canada, um, we actually didn't have... Uh, a financial crisis. Obviously, we shared in the global recession because it had global impacts. But one of the things that happened in Canada that has made Canada so different is we had a, a very brief and mild recession, came out of it. We've had pretty steady in the last, you know, 15 years, pretty steady income growth across the quintiles. So, you know, I think I, I'm not trying to reduce this simply to uh, you know, partisan um, uh, partisan sure. uh, positions, but right. I do think I do think that both conservative and liberals, in different ways, have pursued ideological tangents that I think are partly responsible for some of our our problems. Just today. to follow up on that point, yeah. liberals right. in this country would say, "Well, yeah, it was that part of the Clinton administration that was making concessions right. to the right, yeah. um, and that Canada came out of the financial crisis better than the United States." because you didn't have those loosey-goosey rules of the road for banks that let them turn regular mortgages into stocks and bonds, detaching the banks from the risks of the actual mortgages. What would you say to that? No, look, I, 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 there's, there's obviously a lot of truth uh, in the fact that we in Canada maintained um, a more rigorous system of, of financial regulation. And, and I'm a strong advocate of having a system of financial regulation. One, I'm a 
for, for what it's worth, my background, I'm an economist uh, by training, and I'm a free market economist, but I happen to believe that the fundamental regulations in the financial sector are necessary for the long-term stability of the economy. It's one of the reasons we didn't pursue. We pursued some financial deregulation prior to my coming in office, but we certainly did not, our government did not extend that, which turned out to be fortunate. In fairness, uh, Brian, it's also the case that in Canada, the banking system is uh, concentrated in a fairly small number of players. Five banks are you know, overwhelmingly dominant. There's a sixth that's a fair size and then, and then a number of smaller ones. So frankly, the execution of a, of a regulatory environment is a much simpler process in Canada than it is in the United States. But I'm a strong believer that you need sound financial regulation um, for the long-term viability of the economy. Listeners, we have the rare opportunity of speaking to former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Here in the green space, you may call up. Audience in the green space, you may raise your hands. Listeners, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. His book is called Right Here, Right Now, Politics and Leadership in the Age of Disruption. About immigration, um, would it be fair to say that many liberal Americans may not realize that Canada has an immigration system with large similarities to what Donald Trump wants, which is to say immigration based more on what applicants are believed to have to offer economically um, and how easily they might assimilate, rather than as much family unification as we have in this country? Yeah, that's actually true. Um, Canada's system has historically consisted of three immigration streams, uh, an economically labor market oriented stream that's based on a point system. People get points for various qualifications or credentials or skills they may have in their relevance to labor market success. Um, but it is certainly not the whole system. There is a big humanitarian chunk and there is a significant family reunification chunk. Under my government, the, the economic class, which was the largest, we expanded it further. I think it became up to something like two-thirds of the total became economic. In the United States, the system is overwhelmingly based, since the mid-1960s, as you know, overwhelmingly based simply on a family reunification and family ties. And look, as I say, we have that part of that in Canada, but... I argue vigorously in the book, if you want to have a successful immigration system for the 21st century, it is essential that that system be tied to economic needs. And, um, you know, I think the administration is right to pursue that kind of a that kind of an orientation. And what about refugees? I don't know how much of David Miliband, the previous guest, you were able to hear, president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Um, he praised Canada for its pretty open to refugees policy. And that's my basic understanding from things that I've read. Canada is more uh, limiting on regular immigration than the United States, but more open historically and currently to refugees. How would you describe well, it? Well, I, I wouldn't agree with the first part. Um, under my government, I think it's the same under the current government, Canada has had the largest per capita immigration program in the world. So, the, you know, Canada, we're approaching 300,000 immigrants a year. It's getting close to 1% of the population, which is proportionately um, um, would be larger, I think, than U.S. Uh, legal immigration. Um, but, yes, we do have also, we've had historically, uh, you know, fairly generous refugee policy. In fact, I would actually argue, and one of the things my government wrestled with was, refugee status was so easy to obtain in Canada and so difficult for the government to refuse that we've had significant abuse of the refugee process. But we do have a significant refugee strain. You know, I would just caution that, you know, we're, we're, we accept, Canada accepts tens of thousands of refugees a year. And that's, you know, I think that's generous and that's large scale, but that's, of course, you know, it's still, it's still a small number compared to the scale of the refugee problem we now see around the world. What were those abuses you were referring to of the refugee program? Well, people who make claims who just clearly aren't refugees. Um, you know, that we have refugee claimants from Europe and from the United States. Um, uh, the, 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 problem, the problem is that the appeals process historically has been so lengthy that it was in many cases desirable for people to simply game that system. So we've, 
basically. At least our government was trying to deal with some of that problem. You know, some of them may have been coming from the United States. There was a cartoon yeah. in The New Yorker just after Trump was elected uh, that showed Canada building a wall <laughs> to keep out all the liberals trying to become illegal immigrants to our northern neighbor. <laughs> um, um, on, on this point, here's, here's a challenging question to you from Twitter. Uh, from a self-identified Canadian, does former Prime Minister Stephen Harper think that leaning into anti-immigrant and anti-refugee policies is a sustainable platform for a political party? It did not seem to work for him in Canada. Well, uh, of course, that was far from being my policy. As I think we've said, uh, uh, we ran the largest per capita immigration program in the world. It did so with overwhelmingly with overwhelming public support. And interestingly enough, the Conservative Party of Canada is one of the few center-right parties in the world that actually gets a, a, large, a large percentage, and in some cases, some elections, even a majority of the, the immigrant vote. So I happen to, I happen to think that um, a pro-immigration policy is actually essential for economic growth and, and success down the road, but I actually think, as with you know, I tell people I'm pro-market, I'm pro-trade, I'm pro-globalization, I'm pro-immigration, but you really have to do these policies right. And in a lot of countries, these policies are not being done right, and they are causing serious problems. And, and we found the best way on things like immigration, the best way to get the public to accept a vigorous immigration policy is uh, have good immigration policies, but also accept that there are immigration problems and immigration abuse and deal with those as well. Don't deny that they exist. Um, so what do you think of the Trump administration cutting and cutting each year the number of refugees that it's going to take, now down to 30,000, which would be the same as Canada as a cap, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and of course we have so many people in the United States relative to Canada. What, what do you think of it? Is it Islamophobia? Um, how would you judge it as a conservative and a leader of the world's conservative parties? Look, I tell, I tell people that in this book, I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to focus on Donald Trump, on obviously his personality, or frankly to judge the success or failures of the administration or any other government. I'm, I'm really in the book trying to take people to the bigger issues that are driving right. these phenomena and right. what I think needs to be but I think and you what I think needs to be done. And what I would say about American immigration policy and, and the observation I would have about immigration policies around the world, I believe that one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things that has made Canada generally so accepting of a vigorous immigration policy is that our immigration system has historically and almost always been driven almost exclusively by legal immigration. And my observation around the world is where illegal or irregular immigration comes to dominate public support for all types of immigration, including refugees, humanitarian, and legal immigration falls dramatically. And so I think the challenge for the United States and for those who want to see a vigorous legal immigration policy, which I think could help um, the American economy over time is to tackle the illegal problem. Otherwise, you will continue to see this kind of public reaction. We have a question for you here in the green space. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I, I'd like to talk about national health insurance, single payer, and so on. Um, had you been in government in the mid-60s when it was passed in Canada, would you have voted for it, number one, and number two? Um, it seems to me that because Canada has a parliamentary system, as opposed to the two-party dictatorship, which we have in this country, um, it would be easier to pass such a program as national health insurance in, in this country. So we need another revolution, right? <laughs> Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know what I. In the mid 1960s, I was sort of four or five years old, so I'm not sure how I would have uh, voted at that time. Do you support it today? Um, yeah, broadly, all Canadian political parties support uh, the healthcare system. If I could, maybe I don't talk a lot about healthcare in the book, but yeah. let me just make the following observation, Brian. And I don't purport to be a healthcare expert, although I ran the government of Canada. Healthcare is in Canada principally a provincial responsibility. It is the provinces that actually run and administer our health care system. They all are essentially single payer, although there is some significant uh, private presence people don't, uh, uh, people don't, maybe aren't as aware of. But um, my observation is the following. 
as I, I did way back as an economist study a little bit of healthcare systems, and what struck me about Western healthcare systems, as different as they were, single payer or a mixed system or a more privately oriented system in the United States, what struck me was how similar all of the problems actually were. And, and I think that a big part of the problem we have in healthcare today is, is actually not, in a sense, the failures of the system, it's the success of the system. We are getting so much better through modern drugs, surgery, other advanced techniques. We are getting so much better at extending life that you know there's literally almost always something we can do to extend life farther and to deal with a particular illness. And the fact of the matter is that we can't do everything for everybody because the cost would be prohibitive. Obviously, the very wealthy can afford you know, the most experimental treatments, et cetera. And so every system is faced with um, you know, problems of how they decide how much health care they can actually afford and give out. And in, and in a system like the uh, United States, it's frankly more determined by price. And in a system like Canada's, it's more determined by queuing and rationing. And every, these are the realities. Everybody rations in one way or the every, other. Everybody does to some degree. But either, I guess, the Medicare for All camp in the United States would say um, the Canada system is better because the rationing is rational. And mm -hmm. in the United States, the market is, you know, haphazard, and it's the luck of who you're born to or things like that. Yeah, I, I don't know if the rationing is always rational. What I, would, what I would, would note is this, that there are a lot of Canadians. First of all, on the positive side, you know, no Canadian goes bankrupt from being unable to get adequate financial care. But different kinds of care are more difficult to get in timely ways than others, and many Canadians of means come to the United States. And you know, one of the strengths of the American system that should never be forgotten is virtually all health innovation occurs in this country. And so I would, you know, I, if, I guess I would, in an ideal world, I would urge the US to find ways of changing its systems to adapt some of the benefits of a system like Canada's, but in a way that preserves that innovative nature. My guest is the former conservative Prime Minister of Canada. He was the Prime Minister from 2006 to 2015, Stephen Harper. He's got a new book called Right Here, Right Now, Politics and Leadership in the Age of Disruption. And let's take one phone call for you from uh, Tony in Park Slope. This is line three, control room. Tony in Park Slope. Hi, Tony. You're on WNYC with Stephen Harper. Hello, Brian. Hello, Prime Minister Harper. Hello, Green Space audience. Um, I have a question somewhat semantic, uh, what would you define, how would you define the word conservative? What does it mean to you personally? Uh, how, how do you see it uh, across global politics? Uh, what precisely are conservatives trying to conserve? Yeah. So I, I'm not sure I would spend a lot of time um, trying to uh, you know, precisely define it. Obviously, like all political labels, it, uh, you know, there's a range, people with a range of ideas who, who uh, would use the label, just as there are with liberal and socialist people with very different views. Uh, the kind of conservatism I'm advocating in my book, uh, as I say, is one that is, um, you know, essentially um, pro-market, pro-trade, pro-immigration, pro-globalization but in a way that recognizes the challenges that people are facing today and adapts the policy solutions that it is proposing and that, to that, the real challenges that people are facing today. Because um, the conservatism that's been, the globalist conservatism, right. has led to the populist and authoritarian uh, rise in many of the countries who's, you know, who your group th uh, that represents all the conservative governments of the world seeing on the rise? No, I, I haven't. I would not say so simply. I, it'd be f it, it's certainly not yes. the thesis of my book that a right. bunch of conservative governments led to this. And in many ways, I think that some of these things, w we got to a lot of this problem by the tangents that liberals took the post-war era to, um, you know, anti-nationalism, erasure of borders, um, corporatism. Um, I think many of these values are actually more liberal than they are conservative. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't simplify it that way. And so all. I'll give you, and we're going to run out of yeah. time, but the last word kind of along those lines, because you argue in the book that unless 
conservatism gets back on track, the unprincipled populism of Trump will only grow more popular or even worse, the left will get into power. Right. What is it about the American left that you consider worse than Trump? So there are, there are, two, um, there are two kinds of um, sort of populist, uh, they're, they're sometimes linked and they're sometimes distinct. There are two kinds of populist reactions we're now having in the world to what I say are kind of poor outcomes for, for working and middle class people in advanced Western societies. One is along the lines of kind of the rise of nationalism. And obviously that can have an ugly side, but I actually happen to think that a healthy nationalism is part of a healthy society. And those kinds of problems can be dealt with and we can frankly modify economic policies to deal with um, the concerns of ordinary people while retaining a dynamic society. My concern is the other kind of populism, which I think is much more threatening, which is a populism that leans towards traditional socialism. Because my view is if at this point in the West, with the economic challenges that we do have, were we to turn to socialist economics, and I mean this in the economic sense, government ownership and control of the means of production, et cetera, that that would put us on a long-term economic decline that would become irreversible with the current global competition that we face. So I think that and, is the real threat. And in our last 15 seconds, social democracy, democratic socialism, without the government owning the means of production? Well, that's not really a socialist economic system. Um, so the American left is not socialist? Well, some of them are. Mr. Sanders is, by his own admission. He wants the government to own companies? And Mr. Mr. Sanders believes in socialist economics. He's been pretty clear on that. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom is an even better example, who is, is a Marxist. And that, I think, is the real threat if conservatives do not adapt to the current populist wave. Stephen Harper, his book is right here, right now, Politics and Leadership in the Age of Disruption. Thank you so much for, for having us. Appreciate it. And listeners, thank you for listening. Audience, thank you for coming to the Brian Lehrer Show in the green space today. Support for WNYC comes from New York Presbyterian, New York's top-ranked hospital for the past 18 years, according to the 2018-19 rankings by U.S. News & World Report. Amazing things are happening here. Learn